Hello UK Crime Book Club. Thank you everyone for joining us. We've had um, a great day so far and I am so excited, so excited for my panel. So would you all like to introduce yourselves and um, if you have books with you to show off, you're more than welcome to. It doesn't have to be just the Isolated Places books, show off whatever you want. So Cheryl, thank you for joining us so early in the morning. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your book? Okay, I'm Cheryl Clark. So I'm in New Zealand. Um, I don't actually have any of my books with me That's because I'm fine. on a writing retreat and I didn't bring any. I brought <laughs> things that I'm working on at the moment. So um, You mean you didn't want to lug heavy books with you while you're travelling? Well, not my own, no. I've got a <laughs> big bag of everybody else's instead. <laughs> um, but my first crime novel was Trust Me, I'm Dead which is set in Melbourne, Australia, uh, which is where I was living up till two years ago. And then I moved back to New Zealand. Um, and that was published by Verve Books. They've published all three in the series. Um, and I was very lucky I got shortlisted for the CWA debut bagger back in uh, 2018. And Verve Books um, offered me a contract from that. So. That's where I'm at. I have three at the moment and others, obviously, that I'm working on. Effa. Hi. Um, I write as Effie Birch. I'm known as Effie Marilyn. I have other different names as well. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just ditch these now. I've shown them off a bit. Um, <laughs> this is my novel, She's Not There, and that is the one that's set in an isolated remote place. And mm. I won the pitch for that in 2012 for the bloody Scotland Pitch Perfect but life got in the way of it. So it was only actually published earlier this year. Um, I did write Confessions of an Undercover Cop in 2013, published by Harper Collins as Ash Cameron, but I'm very much an Effie person, persona, personality. Um, I'm currently writing the second in the series of the DS Cat Dubois series, and I'm also writing a new project, which I'm really excited about. And I'm very impressed that I had Dubois right in my head. Because uh -huh. anyone who knows me knows I can't pronounce anything properly. Dana, tell us about yours. Yeah, uh, I write as DL Marshall. And my debut came out two years ago now, which is Anthrax Island, um, the third in what my publisher has started calling the Tyler Trilogy, came out um, last month at the start of September. Um, 77 North, the book in between is Black Run, and, and all three are set in isolated locations. They're all locked room murder mysteries um, in the sense of impossible crime, um, but then they also take place at uh, Anthrax Island, suspiciously on, a, on an island. You'll be kind of <laughs> surprised to hear. Black Run <laughs> takes part on a, a ship um, in the middle of the channel, and 77 North in an old Soviet hotel um, in Siberia. So all very isolated. First thing I'm going to say is none of you have made it easy for yourselves with these books. You would think that sticking someone in an isolated place and all the things that go on would be a nice, easy task. You know, rather than a big city where there's so much all over the place and CCTV everywhere and there's people everywhere and all of that, you think, oh, it'd be nice and easy and isolated. No, I don't know how you've all done it. Your books have had me scratching my head. I can't believe how much you fitted in and made th made this isolated place just so hard for the people who are in your books. You've um, yeah, you've all done a cracking job. Why isolated places, Cheryl? Uh, well, one good thing about an isolated place is, um, especially in Australia and in New Zealand, there's um, there are lots of places where there's no cell phone or mobile phone reception, um, which often ties into your plot really conveniently. Mm. Um, but also um, I grew up in a little teeny-weeny place um, on a dairy farm and I know from um, that experience um, I found out many years later when I was all grown up how many people in that little community had... Um, quite dark things and dark secrets going on and so you know that's always an inspiration you know it doesn't matter whether there's 10 people or 10,000 you're still going to have characters who are 
hiding things and trying to get away with things. So, uh, yeah. You'd think it'd be harder to hide things in an isolated place, but actually I suppose it would be the opposite because there's not as many people to kind of come along and see what you're up to. Exactly. Yeah, all kinds of things. Effie? Well, for me, it's, it's two-stranded. Um, one, I mean, my tagline on my book is a small place is no place to hide because, you know, everybody knows everybody in a small place. Yeah. When I left the police force, for a number of different reasons, we moved from the northeast up to Scotland, and I went to a remote place, and I thought, well, I can just hide here. But you actually, you can't, because everybody knows you and everybody knows your business and what they don't know, the make up. And I used to travel <laughs> a lot between Scotland and England on the train, and I love, I just love the, the beautiful countryside, and it, it is so remote. And I used to think about all the dead bodies that were buried out there, and all I wanted to do on these train journeys was just find a dead body somewhere and say, ring the police and say, there's a dead body on there on the train track, or, you know, just past the train track and everything. And I thought, what, what it would be like and why somebody would bury a body there. So when I started writing this book, I actually lived up in Scotland and I just thought, well, there's lots of secrets in a small place, like Cheryl said, and all of the older people know all the current people's pasts that they probably don't even know themselves. And I thought it would be good to set something there. Well, you see, mine's a lot coffin mystery because it was a, a coffin. Um, it was a dead body that turns up in a tree in the hillside that had been cremated two years earlier. Well, how does that happen and how can a body get out of a coffin? Because you can't cremate somebody without the cremator noticing there wasn't a body there. So how does all of that work? And that's, I just love the idea of a small place because it's so deliciously rich in atmosphere and tension and countryside and people and weird people. More so being anonymous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Done it. Um, I think there's a couple of different strands to why why remote. I think, firstly, well, my my favourite um, book, my favourite crime book is, and then there were none, Agatha Christie, which is like one of the sort of pinnacle um, of that genre, that um, inhospitable, um, isolated location. You can't escape. There's nowhere to go, and you know there's a killer there. You know that one of these people somewhere on this island, for example, is a killer and you you're just forced to be stuck there and work through it and figure out and get to the solution or die trying um and that kind of brings this whole like extra element of peril to it i think you can't you can't go anywhere else um you know whether that's an island a ship or you know even just up on the moors you know there's nowhere to run to that kind of thing um so I really, I really like that that additional kind of peril. One of the things I really wanted to do when I was writing my books is I wanted to write those kind of Agatha Christie um, country house murder mysteries, mm. but I really wanted my protagonist to be not a Poirot that comes in after the crime's been committed and then solves it. I wanted him to be there as the crime was committed in, in, some, um, in some respect, and, and he could be next and that peril to be like an integral part of the story because he can get that urgency and for him not to be able to get away. One thing I didn't expect when um, Kaz put out the, me and Kaz and Karen um, had a chat about what kind of um, interviews we wanted to do. And it was suggested isolated places, which is really my kind of thing. Um, I remember reading um, Sleep by Callie Taylor, sat on the Isle of Rum oh, in Scotland God. and loving it. And I really like that kind of thing that you've all got going. But I did not expect to find the isolation within the characters, the communities, people who isolate themselves, people who are isolated by the community for various reasons, and how all of that was just going to give your plots and characters and stories such a rich depth. I, I didn't expect that. And there is something special within each book because of that. So um, that was a really nice thing. Did Was that a conscious thing? Obviously, you didn't know we were going to be having a panel <laughs> about isolated places. But was it a conscious desire to have this kind of isolation within your characters and the communities? Cheryl, shall we go For through? me it was, yes. Um, I think I've always had this fascination with um, hermits um, and and then you start thinking, okay, well, why would somebody deliberately 
um, isolate themselves from the world, you know, be trying to deliberately isolate themselves from the world. And that's where um, my character Judy's backstory comes in, you know, that whole thing of um, a terrible childhood but the reverberations of that throughout her whole life and as much as she tries to escape all of that and hide in her cottage in the middle of nowhere, um, it doesn't work, of course. And so she's drawn back into all of the things that she's tried to get away from through the death of her brother. And um, uh, so it's that inner conflict, you know, I don't want to do this, but I have to. And so right from the beginning, your character's are fighting, she's fighting with herself as much as the world. Mm. Yeah, fair. I think for me, my character, she's she's a widow and she she isolated herself by going to London from the, the place in Scotland where she lived, which may or may not be designed on the place where I used to live. <laughs> um, and it, she moves to London, she's there for 20 years and she, she becomes a widow and her mum passes away in Scotland, so she now decides the time's right to go back. But she is quite an isolated character, and I didn't want to do the typical drunk. I didn't want to do the typical um, cop that tends to be in fiction. Well, we're all looking for something different, aren't we? So mm -hmm. I thought, if I make her a dedicated cop who doesn't break the rules, um, who is a widow, who, who is a bit of a tortured soul because of her demons in the past, and then she goes back thinking it's so far in the past, but she's still confronted with it. And her sidekick is a crime writer, Jed Gillespie, who is on the run from his past. And they meet up together, and he is a bit of a rule breaker because you have to have that, don't you, like in your double duo thing. And I just like put them in an isolated place because I think when you're isolated, you take solace. And I did that when I went to Scotland, I went to this place, and it was somewhere where you, it's quiet and you can rest your head until everybody discovers who you are and what you're about and make it up anyway. But I just like that that tension. I think it adds that different perspective to it. And equally, I think you can be lost in a busy place as well. But for atmosphere, um, I think that I like the isolated bits. I've got to admit, yeah, when I read something that sets somewhere isolated, it is a very special thing and it's very different. It's really my kind of thing. Kaz was a genius for getting you three on <laughs> and these three books and this panel title. Danny? Um, yeah, it was absolutely conscious. I mean, the first book, um, Anthrax Island, is set in a real, a real island off Scotland. But it was used for biological weapons testing during the Second World War, and that actually happened. And it was the, the testing left the that left the island uh, lethally infected with anthrax for decades. Um, you know, in real life, it was it was quarantined. And so you've got this kind of Russian doll of of isolation. You've got the the locked room in which you know a, a pivotal murder happens. Uh, with the protagonist right outside the door. But you've got this uh, a scientific base on the island as well, which is hermetically sealed um, because of all the, you know, the bacteria, um, and the anthrax. And then you've got the island itself. And then you've got a storm, because you've always got to have a storm when you're on an island. And it's in remote northwestern Scotland anyway, which is isolated as it is. But then you've got the characters who are all, most of the people in this base are scientists, um, and our protagonist is flown in, he's dropped onto the island to um, ostensibly make some repairs to the base, but he finds out that it's been sabotaged and that his predecessor was murdered and everything spirals from there. But he's very much a fish out of water, which is kind of that other form of, of isolation. You know, he's this, uh, on the face of it, working class technician in thrown in with this bunch of um, scientists who they don't seem to speak the same language sometimes there's a lot of kind of standoffish characters in there and he's very very isolated and very much on his own and seeing as you've um, brought up the beginning of yours danny i'm going to ask cheryl and effie to do the same because they're all very very different openings um effie yours is an <laughs> interesting one um there is i mean do you want to explain so i'm not it's um, not going to be a spoiler for the beginning anyway is it but no, I mean, the beginning chapter, it's very well written but it's a very difficult prologue it is a difficult read it is really difficult read and i did worry about putting that but i think you've got to set your stall out to start with agreed to know what they're going to get when they read it 
it wasn't graphic or I like to think it wasn't graphic but you left no, no doubt as to yeah. what's happening and it's very much about the the atmosphere the scenery the you know what's happening without it being said I like to think and mm. it's a flashback scene and the idea is well you know it relates to the story somehow but you're not quite sure how and it's not the main thrust of the investigation the investigation is this dead body that's found on the hillside so it's sort of like the the subplot as it were um but it does set the scene it's got the isolation it's got the remote place and it's got something quite horrible that that's been going on that goes on all of the time and you see my background is working with cases like that so i can draw on that when i'm writing and it's a very delicate balance not to do it i know i do write too dark sometimes and i've written lots of short stories that people can't read because it is too much for them but i have to be authentic and that's what how i write really do you want to for anyone who's not read it yet do you want to give them an idea of just what happens in that prologue yes it's about a young girl who's gone through a park and there's an abuser who meets her on her way home from school or every time she's gone through the park and he's older than her but not too much older than her and it's about her trying to avoid him and what he's going to do and how it works and um it's a child abuse story, but um, it sets the same because the whole book is about the things people do to each other and they're not always nice and we all hide in different places and these bad people hide in places, but they're there waiting for you if you wish to see them. That's not to say there's somebody on every street corner, there isn't. But mm -hmm. bad people find the places to go to do the things they do. And Cheryl, I mean... The, the main thing with the opening is just how much damage a phone call can do was one of the things that I thought. <laughs> do you want to explain a little bit about the opening of yours? And then I'll have to try and remember which order I've got you all in for the next question. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it begins with Judy um, believing that she's leading this lovely, peaceful life with her garden out in the middle of nowhere in this little tiny town. Um, and her one friend in the town or village, if it's, you know, um, don't really say village in Australia, um, is the local cop. So I did a lot of research years ago for something else about what's called uh, one person police stations in Australia, in Victoria. And so he's her one friend, but it's his job to come and tell her um, that her brother's been murdered and and so that's the opening scene where she's been estranged from her brother uh, because he was a drug addict. And um, it's one of the things she had to remove herself from. And and it's just brought everything back. That, um, and the guilt because she hasn't seen him for so long and now she'll never see him again. Like I say, you're all very, very, very different books, but I love the fact that they've all got a similar kind of idea behind them. Um, Kaz asked, what's the most isolated place you've ever visited? So, Cheryl, should we go back to you so I know which order I'm in? <laughs> um, there's places in Australia that are extremely isolated, simply because Australia is so huge and the outback is also huge. So probably... Uh, many years ago, I drove from Brisbane across the middle of outback Queensland to a mining town called Mount Isa, and it's really isolated out there. Um, places like that, you do not want to go um, with a car that might break down, um, and you especially do not want to go off the road because you'll probably never be found again. Um, and the one thing I remember about... That trip was um, a lot of what we call road trains, which are these massive um, semi-double B trailers, usually with cattle on them or all sorts of things going backwards and forwards to the mining towns. Um, and one of them had hit a huge um, cow and then I nearly hit the huge cow, which was on the road, bloated and rotting and extremely um, smelly. And I stopped nice. about six inches from it. So that's what I remember of that trip. That um, that sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it was really gross. <laughs> I bet it was. Effie. Well, uh, I think the most isolated I've been was in my own head as a child, I think. 
Um, but in terms of, and that's why I love fiction, because I just used to read and read and read a lot as a kid. Um, but as an adult, um, I think probably, oh, I did the Three Peaks um, when I was 17, and I was the only girl out of 11 guys. Obviously, there was a, an old man who was our guide, and they were all teenagers. And it was in the middle of the night, and we didn't know where we were going, and it was foggy, it was raining, and it was dreadful, and we got lost. And actually, thinking about it, I could write a story about that, couldn't I? <laughs> and that was really scary. That was really mm. um, hard. And I just imagined when we looked the next day when it dawn, when the dawn came and you know, looked the way we'd come, it was just horrific. Anything could have happened. How the heck any of us survived that, I don't know. But in my book, there won't. I was going to say, if you don't write it, there's um, there's a lot of crime writers watching at the moment who are probably scribbling things about cows that they nearly hit and isolated islands and um, let's not go in the bushes on the park. There's, there's a lot there's a lot going on. Oh, Danny? Um, I've done a couple of big road trips in the States, so from San Francisco up to Seattle, and we kind of diverted through the backwoods of... Northern California and Oregon and Washington, so Bigfoot country. And some of that was really, really isolated. We went through areas where there's a lot of the illegal uh, marijuana farms as they, they were back then. It was pre some of it being legalized and they're sort of ruled by gangs and a lot of them and things like that. And that's kind of weird places to drive through. Um, and, and in the South, we drove up through um, on a different trip. We drove through Louisiana and um, we took the equivalent of B roads for about 300 miles because we didn't want to be on the highway. And I, I got stopped. We were going through swamps and everything, and it was real kind of backcountry stuff. And <laughs> I got stopped by the, the parish sheriff in one part for speeding, and I wasn't speeding at all. He, he stopped me because I had Florida plates on, I think, and that was quite mm. scary. Really, really, it wasn't a nice encounter. Um, so that was that made me rethink doing that. Uh, driving through the backwoods of America. But I think I think as well, I, we drove up, we did a research trip up to Scotland when I was writing Anthrax Island, up to the island, and we didn't get there. We drove north from Inverness for about another hour, and it gets very kind of, very isolated. You're up in the, way up in the northwest of the highlands, and um, it was snowing, and it was coming down really thick, and the road was completely covered. There was no other traffic, and we were driving for ages. And we started sliding and going into the ditch at the side of the road and things. And my uh, partner next to me was about, um, at the time, 10 months pregnant, I think. And Ten so months. we kind of, yeah, we, we had um, our son um, just a couple of months after that trip. So we had to turn around. I, I wanted to carry on, but it, it was getting dicey. We had to turn around and we nearly got stuck getting turned around. The snow was so thick. And we had to get all the way back to Inverness. But that, even that, I mean, it's in this, this um, <clears throat> in Scotland, but it's, it's quite isolated there. Um, we have had a lot of hellos from um, members and one of them I was having a look at because it just came up as a um, Facebook user was um, Victoria Dowd, another one. Um, Chris McDonald, we've got lots of people who um, normally watch. Um, Angie Plant said he could easily be lost off the roads towards us. Where are you, Angie? Okay. Um, Alex Hall is saying, um, Lottery and Mysteries are a favourite of his. If you were <laughs> isolated like the author from Misera, what would you do to distract yourself and how would you escape differently to the film? No, we're presuming that everyone's seen Misery, which I haven't, because I'm a big old wuss. Um, Danny, you did have to warn me there was going to be a bit of horror. I was glad of the warning in the book. Um, I am a big old wuss, but I can handle most things in a book, but on a screen, quite different. Um, but if and if you're not sure about Misery, which I wouldn't have a clue, um, how would you escape and how would you distract yourself if you're in a locked room? I'm going to throw that out to anyone who fancies a bash at that first. I can't watch it anymore because I, I broke my ankle um, a few years ago really badly and anyone who's seen Misery knows where I'm going with it because my foot was on sideways and I had to get taken to hospital and get it pulled and put right. And um, I so the short answer is I wouldn't escape. I'd just lie there crying and, and <laughs> that'd be that. Oh, bless you. 
<laughs> That'd probably be me as well. I think I'm very much fight or flight. I'd either be curled up in the fetal position, crying and trying not to whack myself. My kids are going to love that. I've said that on camera. Or I would, um, I'd be scratching eyes out. I don't think there's anywhere in between. There's no grey area with me. I think um, I, I wouldn't be able to escape on a physical level. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to get out and do what he did and everything. But I would try to appeal to her better nature and talk to her and befriend her and try to manipulate her to let me free and let's write a book together and let's be friends and come and be my partner. And then as soon as I got a trust, I'd be off. Mm. I think that would work because she's so blooming lovely. You know, everyone always <laughs> says how lovely you are. I think that would really work. But then, I don't know. I feel like there'd be a bit of byplay there of, yeah. well, are you really um, drawing her in? Or is she just letting you think? you're? Oh, there's another story right in itself here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think, like Show you me. say, there's, there's, no, um, there's no middle ground, is there? Um, once you realise that you're probably not getting out of there alive, it's... Um, it's going to be, have you got it in you to um, injure her badly enough that she can't get up and stop you leaving? Um, and, you know, I, I've done, years ago, did self-defence classes and some of the things that you're taught to do in a self-defence class could be, you know, potentially um, lethal. And I always thought if... If it really came down to it, could I do that? So I guess you don't know until you're actually in that position. Let's hope none of us ever know. I do mm. not want to be, what is, is the word hobbled? Is that <laughs> yes. is that the word that I've heard? Right, okay. So I've got some ideas and Donna's saying misery is brilliant except for that one scene. Well, that doesn't help me, Donna. I don't know what that one scene is. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to tell me. It's, it's fine. Um, oh, and she's in Sky. Okay, oh, gorgeous. Mm. Yeah, she's nice in Sky. Mm. Um, oh, Laura's saying Abby Davis' homage to Misery, her number one fan, was so good. Lots of escape attempts. I like that. Um, I haven't read that one yet, but I believe Kaz did. One of the um, things I wanted to ask you is that um, what you are working on at the moment. So, Cheryl, would you like to go first? Um, right now at the retreat, um, I've been working on a couple of things, but mainly um, Judy Westerholm series number four, um, even though possibly it might never get published. She's just a character I just can't let go of. And I had, <laughs> had an idea for the fourth book, and I kept thinking, no, I, I've got other things I want to write, but it just kept um, nudging at me and nudging at me. And so that's what I'm, I'm about 20,000 words into um, and doing a lot of research on courtroom scenes um, because she's on a jury. So, yeah, and it's really good to be back with the character. And um, after three books, I feel like... Um, She's inside my head, so maybe that's why I just can't put it down. Mm, I have to keep going. Effie? Well, I'm supposed to be writing, and I am writing, the, the second <laughs> of the series of Cat Dubois, and it's Last Train Through Pit Lockery, set in Scotland, and it's the second in the book. But I'm actually, since I went to Harrogate in July, I had an idea for a new series, and I'm absolutely loving writing it. And it's not as dark as my usual stuff, and... I've got ideas for so many ideas for future books for it. And it's about, and don't anybody pinch this because I know you've got it from here. Is it um, a detective, a genealogy detective investigator going back, looking at people's pasts, uncovering the histories of murders, of rapes, of why we're here, parents who aren't parents, adoptions, um, foundlings, and it's going back historically but also the present day and trying to fit the pieces together of all the crimes of the past coming forward to the future so it, it could be a bit cozy it's a bit historical and it's not anywhere near as dark as i normally write and i just love writing it so i was gonna say so you're not struggling with the idea of it being completely different no i'm loving it absolutely like a breath of fresh air well i, I suppose what's helped is i always knew my father was a bastard because we found out 20 years ago he's actually from halifax near where danny lives 
Um, what, what, that, make, that makes him a bastard, thank you. I was just going to no. say, like, how do I, how do I defend <laughs> Johnny here? correlation there. No, no, the bastard bit is because his father isn't who his father was thought to be. And it was actually a man from Halifax. And we're, we're discovering all of that. But what I hadn't banked on was finding out that my mother was too. And all those Irish genes I thought I had, we found out just a couple of months ago, actually, we're well, not Irish at all, but her father is a man from Surrey, which I now have to explore. And that gave me the idea of how we're all here and the secrets of the past and the older generation know, but they're all dying off. And genealogy research is huge. You, you know, people watch Who Do You Think You Are and DNA Secrets. And I'm in tears every time I watch these programmes. Mm. And I just think there's so many secrets out there. And why are they being held and there's murders and obviously every book's going to have to have a murder and crimes and stuff like that but my investigator has to investigate so yeah sorry i love how passionate you are with that idea you just you really lit up with the idea of that then i love it i just love it and the, the, the audience for these programs is huge and there's a huge community out there that love dna research and genealogy research and who are we who are, is anybody who they think they are Two of my four grandparents just aren't. And I'm approaching 60 and I'm just discovering this. So, you know. Danny? I'm writing something uh, a little more fun. Um, the, the third book that came out a month ago, that was the conclusion of the trilogy. Um, so I'm writing standalone at the moment, about halfway through a, it's a locked room murder mystery, impossible crime again, set, um, in a haunted house in the middle of a snowstorm in um, late 1930s on the eve of war uh, in Lancashire. And um, uh, a chap has invited six famous detectives to, um, to this seance, but the reason they're really there is to uncover the identity of their arch nemesis. Um, unfortunately, the detectives themselves start uh, dying one by one in increasingly difficult and baffling impossible locked room scenarios. So another one where you've made it really easy for yourself. Yeah, just on that. <laughs> um, because of your answers to the last one, I have to ask: Do you prefer a familiar character or a fresh character, or is there not really any kind of comparison there, Cheryl? Um, I like both. Um, I think I have to be, you know, I could probably just keep on writing about Judy forever, but I don't I don't think she stays fresh then. I think it's good to mm. write other things in between. So um, I've got another character, a homicide detective, and um, talking about isolated places, in the second book he ends up in Finland trying to find his mother, which is uh, like a big subplot that gets him into trouble in all kinds of ways. And um, I love that character too. So when you start a new novel with a new character, you have to do a huge amount of work to get to know them to the depths that you need to write really effectively about them, or I do anyway. So, um, but I do like inventing new characters and finding out about them. So it's kind of, a mix of both, yeah. Effie? Um, both, really. I mean, predominantly because I wrote short stories for lots of years, you can write lots of different characters every day, and I like that. But then I've got to know Captain Brown, she's in my head, as is the new character, Sally Watson, and I just like them, and I want to spend some time with them, but I couldn't just do one all the time and then move on to the other. I, I, I do like to, to write dif differently, like different, you know, you know what I mean. Danny? I've, I've written standalones that I haven't done anything with and they're on a shelf ready to do something with at some point in the future. And then having written this trilogy and nothing really uh, in between and, and getting to know that character and now writing another standalone, I'm kind of realizing how comfortable it is to to write a series and have a character mm -hmm. who you really you know exactly what they would do in that situation after writing three books about them that you know exactly what they would say and how they would act and now um i'm a bit lost again having to 
discover and I haven't been in that situation before because when I wrote standalones before I hadn't written a series and I kind of appreciate both worlds now it's really liberating to write a standalone that has completely new characters because you can do whatever you like and they can hide secrets in a way that a series character maybe can't um, if we've come to to know them there's pros and cons I like both um, I'm, I'm not sure I've decided yet which is which is my favorite you all seem really immersed in um, in the writing and I wonder if it's possible for you to do you ever switch off from it is effectively what I was going to ask in a really long-winded way um, do your characters leave you alone do you want them to leave you alone or is it constantly something going kind of in the back of your mind about you know um, the book that you're working on or the one that you're writing when you're supposed to be writing another one how are you um how do you balance that because i'm i imagine it must be kind of the brain energy it takes you know it must be mentally exhausting if you don't ever switch off or is it is it invigorating to constantly have something swirling around your head while i'm working on a book it's in my head a lot um i think one of my favorite things to do is um if i wake up a bit early in the morning um and I don't want to get out of bed, is um, I just lie there for half an hour or more just thinking about the book and I get a lot of new ideas. There's something about, you know, maybe that's when my brain is fresh, um, but just thinking through what I've already written and then thinking about what might come next. Um, and often I, I come up with extra plot twists or... Sometimes I realise I've actually got a plot hole that I need to do something about. So that kind of quiet thinking time um, is really important. And I do that kind of thinking, probably not at any other time, because when I'm actually writing, um, the story's right in front of me and it's in my head and, and I'm totally immersed in actually producing the words. But that quiet thinking time, I think, is also really important. Um, well, I have a very busy life. I st you know, I've still got a day job and I've got very busy kids and grandkids and everything. And so my characters do go to sleep. They have to because I have to switch a focus. I can't be thinking about writing. I would spend all my days and probably nights writing if I could. And when I'm immersed in it, I give it everything and I love it. And things like this just really invigorate me. And I do have um, the notes on my phone and the notebook and document on the computer and everything where I, when I have ideas I write them down so they don't disappear because my memory's not like it used to be I have to like and whether I use them or not I don't know but I know I've got that there as a safety net um but I love being immersed in the world and I would do it all the time if I could but unfortunately real life has to take priority on many occasions so they just I have to put them to sleep but they're always there it is quite a skill though to be able to compartmentalize like that because it's not an easy thing to do at all to not have everything bleed into each other all of the time very very difficult it's something that's taken me and a lot of people that i've talked to it about a long time and they're not always successful at it so give us some tips Effie. <laughs> you just manage it you're well, just, just used to it because um after i've won the competition for, for that I was in a very difficult position where I couldn't write because I had that much on. I had teenagers, I ran a business, and we were caring for my mother-in-law who had dementia, and that there was no space for writing at all. So I had to physically switch it off. And it was hard because it was there, and I've always wanted to do it, and I've, I've written whenever I could. But when I could pick it up, then I just went with it. But I had to, I didn't have an option, so it was sort mm. of forced on me, really. So now I'm used to not doing it. I don't want to be in that situation again if I can avoid it. So I just like put them to sleep a bit, like cover them over, tuck them in, and I know that they're waiting. And I, I do that. Quite, it's quite a physical process in my head to do it. I like the idea of that. Tuck them in for the night. Yeah, they can yeah. bugger off and leave you alone for a bit. Yeah. I like that idea. Danny? That's not a skill I've mastered. They're there <laughs> all the time. It's painful. I... Um... The worst thing is that generally, as I get towards about halfway through a book, it's uh, another book that 
starts inhabiting the front of my brain and then I want to write that one instead and that's that's the hardest thing isn't it because mm. you've still got half a book to write you've still got to be immersed in that one and the other one starts nagging at you um it's really bizarre how how deeply you do get immersed in that world and then how quickly it's gone once it's on the page and once the book's out there I I don't think about these at all now because they've been exercised from from my mind um and it's all the other unwritten books that are chattering now um all the other ideas no I I, I really struggle I do focus on the thinking time sometimes you know walking and um with the dog and in the shower and all that time when you when you're alone and there's nobody else talking to you and you can focus on it then I I do really try and visualize specific scenes and things like that what about for all of you drawing a line at kind of a boundary of what um how far you can take a scene um i know sometimes people have been maybe asked by an editor dial editor to dial something back or somebody's you know read something and said actually you know i think you could really go in hard on this bit you could you could really explore that further and um, how do you balance knowing where to draw the line cheryl um i've never been asked to tone things down um not even the swearing um so for me i guess i don't i don't like gratuitous violence but at the same time you know if you've got an action scene or you've got something that's happening that's um full of action um, you've got to create that sense of pace and fear and um, for me it's all about the internals of the character as much as anything and I suppose that's where I put myself in it a little bit you know like if that was me how would I act how would I feel and I have to say Judy is a lot braver than me and a lot um, tougher so, so it's kind of like uh, a, f a bit of a fantasy there about you know no that's probably not what I would really do but um the, probably the only thing that the publishers generally ask me to do is just to trim the fat a little bit you know sometimes I over explain or um scenes go on a bit too long so just to tighten up more than anything but I haven't ever I have in children's books, but in ad, in adult crime, I haven't been asked to tone anything down. Effie? Oh, well, it's difficult because the subject matter that I write about is very often about child abuse because I worked in child protection for very many years and I dealt with this stuff, the real life mm. stuff. Yeah. And when I first started writing, I was writing short stories and I did find that when I was sending them out for submission or into competitions, they weren't getting placed or accepted because they were a bit too dark. But there is a market for that. Um, mm. And as long as it's not gratuitous, I would never, well, I hope I would never write gratuitously, but um, I write authentically and with emotions. And I don't tend to write violence scenes. It's more the mind things and the things that people do to each other. You can do a lot mm. of damage in a gentle way more than in a violent way. When I was writing the Confessions book, because that's sort of like a faction memoir, and a lot of the stories, Harper Collins come back to me and said, um, that's a bit too gritty. Can you t tone it down? Can you make it more of a rounded ending? So there were, a lot of the endings had to be changed to make it more, I suppose, more cosy and more commercial read. So um, I did that. But I am careful not to write gratuitously. And I think that's the difference. People who want to read the gritty stuff will read it. And the people who don't, won't. Um, and that's it really but I am trying to soften what I write because I know there's readers there's people friends of mine who um would read me but don't because of the stuff I write does that make sense yeah of course it does and I suppose it's not really something that you can kind of go right I'll just stick a post-it note over that paragraph yeah because there's, yeah. there's too much woven in you know it's kind of a if you're going to read it you're going to have to read it yes and I yeah, would hate yeah. anybody to think I had to read it because, oh, well, like my son, he stopped reading my collection of short stories because he said, Mum, they were just too tough. I just couldn't do it. And that's my son. 
So, but then another person, oh, I love them. That's the sort of thing I love to write and there's not enough of it. So there's there's markets for everything, isn't there? As long yeah. as it's done properly, I think, authentically. Yeah, I think that's something that's um, we've learned a lot by talking to authors, talking to readers and the discussions in the book club because there is something for everyone and one thing that somebody loves, somebody else will yes. go, oh no, you know, it's just, it's each to their own, which is good because it gives you so much scope. Yeah. Danny, what do you think? Um, I've never had to, well, rarely turn anything down. The trilogy that um, that is out at the moment is by the nature of the style of books they are, um, the only kind of real graphic thing in there is the violence, but it's not sadistic or dark. It's more kind of action-oriented violence, which mm. might still be so, so gruesome for some people. There are some quite grisly scenes um, across the three books, but it's not what I would think of as kind of too dark or anything like that. Um, there was one scene in a standalone that I've written that, I haven't done anything with just yet that my agent asked me to turn down just a touch that was quite mm. nasty, but I intentionally made it quite nasty. Um, and I think I just needed to uh, just tweak it slightly. But no, um, nothing else. There is, I've, I've never written a sexy, there is some in, in these books, but um, I just ignore it completely and just go, yeah, 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 and then they went to bed, boom, next scene, let's move on. <laughs> right, I couldn't write. We're closing the door on it. Yeah, just, there we go, leave them to it. We'll we'll come back tomorrow. I've been reading something of Liz Mysteries uh, recently, and there, there are sex scenes, mm -hmm. and they are very, very good, very interesting. Um, I always think it's a, a, a strange thing that we're all so fine with violence and you can hobble someone, but no, nope, close that bedroom door. That can't happen. Yeah. It's not, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a prude. I just, I just, I think the problem is that I would struggle to write it in an authentic way without either being too flowery or being too, too much the other way and too sort of pornographic. There's a, how do you find that balance? And I'm so scared of not being able to find a balance that I'm just never going to write one. Ever. It's fair enough. I know most crime writers are not touching it. It's just not happening. And that is fair they enough. Are really hard to write. Really hard to write well. Mm. I've written it's one, one of those written, things that. A new series, I've written one in that, and it just developed as a story went and it seemed to fit. Whether it makes the cut or not, I don't know. Um, and I just, it's interesting because I just thought, no, this has to be how it is. But whether or not it translates, I don't know. Only one way to find out, the readers will tell you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are coming up to, we've got six minutes, left, seven minutes left. So I'm going to ask you one of my favourite questions because nobody's used it today. So I'm, I'm going to use it. Um, memorable moments as an author so far. Um, anything at all that you've kind of enjoyed, anything that's really stood out for you? And after doing a little bit of research, I'm wondering if I'm right about what you're all going to choose. So play a little game with myself in my own head. Am I right? So Cheryl. Uh, memorable moments. Um, for me, probably um, going to Finland to research a novel. Um, um, I love, as you might have guessed, because I'm on one at the moment, I love writer's retreats. So I actually went to Finland on a, a writer's residency um, yeah. for a month and was able to interview a Finnish uh, police detective um, and that was absolutely fascinating. And he actually gave me um, a really good extra idea for my um, novel as well that I could weave in. So that was um, probably one of my most memorable um, things about writing, yeah. Never mind the idea of everyone writing ideas down for books. Everyone now wants to go to Finland and do what you did. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Effa? Well, it's quite easy because it only happened in September. Um, after I'd won the, the Pitch Perfect in 2012 for Buddhist Scotland, that was, that was amazing. And then I thought, that after everything that happened, I'm never going to write and all the rest of it. And then this year, I was selected to be a spotlight author for Bar McDermott and Abby Mukherjee. And that is just fabulous. Not as brilliant as Danny's, because he's going to tell you, I'm sure, that 
what is it? Well, so far I've got one out of three right, and it's yours, Effie. Yeah. Go on, Danny. <laughs> Spread some joy. She's right because it's. I mean, there there are loads I could pick. There's been some fantastic um, moments that I I've really enjoyed, but I've got to do the ultimate name drop. I mean, I I did the opening as well uh, as Effie's just said at Bloody Scotland a couple of years ago. It was about six months after Anthrax Island came out whichever uh yeah that was 20 21 and um and i i read my opening chapter and i opened for stephen king and i i don't know you can't really top that can you no yeah where do we even go from there is that it just pen down move away from the laptop <laughs> job done where do you even begin does anyone actually have a favorite stephen king book because i've only um Not me, i was um the, oh the shining and i must have been we're trying to figure out if i was late 20s or the early 30s but i couldn't read it past lunchtime otherwise i wouldn't sleep that night I told you a big old wuss doesn't have to be a stephen king but any kind of other book that's quite scary anything scared any of you seeing as we are at spook fest oh, anyone uh, jumping collection of Stephen King's short stories I think it's called Nightmares and Dreamscapes oh, and there's mm. a story in that that I have never forgotten and it's a revenge story um, out in the desert about a guy who digs a hole in the road and waits for this other guy to come driving along and he drives into the hole and smashes his car and then the guy gets the bulldozer and fills it in on top of him um, I've never forgotten that story. <coughs> and neither will I. I've, I've got a, a really good Stephen King collection of short stories as well called Skeleton Crew, which is an older one. I think it's from the 80s. And yeah. some of the stories in it made it into Tales, uh, a, a creep show film with George mm. Romero. And some of, mm. some of them are in that. There's some really good ones, but one of them in there, I think it's in that one, is The Mist, which was made into a film well, a long time ago now, but that's such a bleak, bleak, horrible film. And it's one of the worst, best slash worst endings of ever, any film ever. It's just awful. Um, there, there is a book that I started reading. I'm just looking for it. I can't see it. It's called The Watchers by Neil Spring. And it's it, and this is like really recently, within the last few years, I started reading it. And I don't know why, but I couldn't get beyond a certain bit. It, it really really terrified me something about it i mm. and i i read quite a lot of horror and I, i'll have to give it another go but like i said this, this was only you know three or four years ago yeah don't read it in the winter and read it when it's really bright sunshine and put it down by 12 lunch and you're mm. fine you'll be fine that's always works for me you are literally building my do not read this on the list well i've got so three. i've got three <laughs> Dead Zone, because that's the first Stephen King I read when I was about 14 or 15, and that set me on my Stephen King journey because he was a massive influence. And I love his short stories, and I like to think, oh, I wish I could write like him, and I tried to focus some of mine like on him, but obviously nowhere near him. Um, so The Dead Zone, Pet Cemetery scared the life out of me. I read it when I lived on my own, and the film was rubbish, but the, the book, The Pet Cemetery, I was absolutely scared stiff of that, and I couldn't sleep. And then Stand By Me, I think that's one of the most, it's my favourite mm. film. And I watch it and rewatch it and rewatch it. And it's just, and that the theme tune is going to be my funeral song, Stand By Me. Mm. And I just love that film and the book, the short story, because it was the body is a short story. Mm. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah. I do love Stand By Me. Yeah. Must have seen that a lot of times. Um, we are literally a minute away from being done. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who has watched. Thank you all for joining me because I'm absolutely thrilled that I found a way to be part of Spookfest without um, without having nightmares. And uh, would you all like to give us a recap of your books before we finish? So Cheryl, a recap. Um, well, just three tell books. us what we're. Yeah. yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, is there a rule? <laughs> no, no rule, no rule yeah. at all. Okay, so uh, Judy Westerholm series published by Verve and Judy is, um, it's set in Australia, both in Melbourne and in a very isolated small town. So lots of action, fast paced and um, a tough character. 
Thank you. Effie. Well, she's not there. It's a skeletal... I love that cover. Thank you. <laughs> skeletal remains are found buried under a tree by the once famous crime writer Jed Gillespie. The skeleton is a woman who had been cremated two years ago, allegedly. Small town of Glendargy is recruited as key, key, DS Cat Dubois starts to unravel secrets in the intricate lives of the community and she discovers a small place is no place to hide at all. Brilliant. Danny? I'll talk about the third book because I've talked about the first. The whole trilogy are sort of Agatha Christie meets Alistair MacLean, they're locked room thrillers, um, uh, action thrillers. And the third book is um, set in a hotel in Siberia, an old Soviet hotel that was used for uh, paranormal experiments during the 70s before it burned down. And um, we jump from there back to the 90s and John Tyler's first ever job um, because it's got a bearing on what's going on in Siberia now. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed this hour. Um, next up, seven till eight, we have the absolutely gorgeous Sarah Moorhead and the equally lovely Stuart Turton. Um, and I have seen them do panels for us, but I've also seen them together in person. They are fantastic. You don't want to miss them. So please do come back at seven o'clock. Thank you all again so much. I hope you'll come back for in individual interviews with us. And we can really dig Thank into you. the books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.